Oh, yeah, I need a little thing. <laughs> Action. Action. <laughs> How They Got Hacked, Episode 5, Tom Lawrence. Xavier Johnson. Maurice Nash. All right, and uh, we have not a sponsor of Arizona, <laughs> but we're reading the ingredients list. The ingredients list on this Arizona, nothing about endpoint security. Ponage. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not really smart, Arizona. Um, I love you. And I've been giving you $1 bills for quite the time. Me too. Great and I'm drink. just sad that you haven't at least taken 30 cents on every buck to put into endpoint protection. That is a great, <laughs> great point. That's a great point. That's a great so, point. So, yeah, we realized that if you didn't know, Arizona T got hacked. They got crypto lockered, like so many other people. Oh and, uh, yeah, unfortunately for them, it sounds like it. Uh, they didn't have a good plan in place. Uh, but maybe that's how they keep the prices low. Cause I got, it's been 99 cents for a long time. <laughs> it's true. Or maybe, maybe it's just water and leaves, right? Like may, maybe tea leaves and water. Don't take that much money to make. I'm going to go with that. As maybe the margins made, are just there. And maybe they thought that just tea leaves and water don't need to be that secure. Yeah. I don't think their ingredients are all that secret. There's no one, no one wants to compete with the 99 cent tea company. I'm gonna throw it out there because like even your your Pepsi and everything else is a lot more money. So. Right, right. Not enough sugar. <laughs> Not enough sugar. Not enough sugar. Know, we we buy it. We actually buy these uh, Arizonas in bulk here at the office. There's like a stack of them over there. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is unfortunate. This is another one of those. I mean, you guys already know where we're gonna go with this, right? Mm. Defense in depth, uh, detective controls, regular backups hygiene these are the ways that you avoid okay so let's say you do get crypto locker right mm -hmm. let's say you get you you run into a ransomware attack um you know you you, you can't find a key you can't go to no more ransomware.org shameless plug yeah um <laughs> and, and you can't go get a, a key right so what do you do well in windows you go to that restore point you go click the button you go okay now my system's back to normal so you have to have that mentality about all of your other systems, right? Yeah. Um, file servers, your file servers and everything your else. email servers, your every every file, every single server you have, mm -hmm. you need to be making an image of regularly, if not daily, weekly, if not weekly, at least monthly, right? Because otherwise, you'll be like these guys. And now, now Arizona's going to be more expensive, I know. right? This Will is why we can't have nice things. Cannot, yeah, or why pay more for things? <laughs> <laughs> or we might not get Arizona because they they have been down for a couple weeks. Yeah, oh boy. it's not going well. They can't well. process orders. They can't even uh, sell Arizona tea anymore. I'm glad I have a stockpile of it because now the value is more than 99 cents. <laughs> oh, boy. Because <laughs> the stores will run out. I read that their systems are only back up by 60%. So yeah. that's not so bad when you think about it. But if uh, one of them's that ordering system, it's really bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Call us. We'll, uh, we'll get that together for millions. you. It's estimated millions. estimated millions yeah. a day. We'll work for tea. We'll work for tea. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> a little all bit right. more than tea. A little more than tea. <laughs> a little bit more than tea. <laughs> now, I link, I mean, this is all going to be in the show notes here. Uh, something interesting happened at the Mar-a-Lago uh, resort where uh, President Trump goes and visits a whole lot. And, oh, boy. Yeah. And the news loves to spin everything on air. Yeah. And we can all sit around speculating. But one of the things I wanted to link to was exactly what happened. And it's uh, the official Secret Service report. And it's I'll just read the basics of it. So on March 30th, 29th, physical screening was conducted by the Secret Service once mar lago staff determined an individual was to be granted access to the property after a first physical screening. mar lago staff transported the individual by shuttle to the next screening checkpoint. Individuals are prohibited from disembarking the shuttle between screenings and the route monitored by the Secret Service personnel. So... There's like two levels of screening to get these people in there, it sounds like. And the first one's like, ah, you look like someone who belongs here. And then the Secret <laughs> Service determines officially whether or not you're someone who belongs here. So the news tries to make it like there's an attack and they find they're digging up every article of everything on there. And that, that's all great and all, but let's talk about what actually happened. Now, we don't know for sure if she was actually there to do good or bad um, right. or if she was just someone with an infected thumb drive. Definitely suspicious, but there's not a lot more information. But we do know that throwing USB drives around is highly effective because people can't resist plugging them in. So those are things that we do know is a potential vector. We also, interesting that she's a, it uh, sounds like she's a Chinese national and had a lot of reasons that weren't adding up as to why she was there, claiming exactly. she attended events and things like that. So those are all some of the facts that we do know about it. But it is an interesting bold attack but it feels too bold to be a national security agency but like she, china she I was naming people that weren't even there yeah so uh, it's kind of shady i i find this to be one of those situations where 
for one, I, I don't want to speculate on it. Yeah. Right, just right. because uh, it, it, it's way too scary. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, like if I start to speculate on it, like, it, it gets really, really creepy. Because let's talk about, like, a situation where maybe Russia and China together are covertly trying to work together to penetrate our systems. Right. And maybe, you know, Russia has the payloads and has the, the abilities and the capabilities, and China may have the people and the relationships to be able to get that's, certain people into certain great areas, point. areas, right? Yeah. And it's also one of those questions that I have is related to it. Is it the uh, classic like you see in the movies, you toss the coin and see what the security guards do when you hear a noise? Right. <laughs> you, you drop someone in who really doesn't know anything, so there's no potential like this. We're just burning this person. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you that's drop true. them off there, yeah. and you just watch also. what happens. You right. watch all the who comes out of the woodworks, what, what protocols were used, because we're testing those protocols. But so, you know what? As a red teamer, I can't say this, and, and any other red teamer that's watching this can, can hear me out. Um, I don't run angry IP scanner until like I'm very finished with everything that I yeah. need. I've already gotten everything off of the network. I don't go loud until I'm actually trying to be found. Right. So right. like for me to get to the point where you know I throw the coin to see what security does, I've already penetrated them right. to a certain extent. So so even then, this is really really bad because how deep are they into our system? I can't go to Mar-a-Lago to, and get past the first layer right. of security. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good guy. Yeah. So, so it, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because, like I said, there's a real physical component to these cyber attacks, and it's about getting deployments. And mm. in reality, no matter what the news says, uh, based on Secret Service report and everything that we know about this, they were far from, and at the time, there was not, you know, there's always probably some related staff there because it's a business that Trump owns, but it's not. I hate all the speculation when they do the mental gymnastics and do this and this. Oh, remember back when this happened or you used an insecure phone? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem like they're going to shove a USB in the phone. That's probably not the attack vector they were working on here. Uh, you can, I know. Can, <laughs> but, but it seems more likely that this was to try to gain access. To Shout out to computers. Darren Kitchen and yes. Hack5 and the yeah. Rubber Ducky because that attack platform yes. is so versatile. Right <laughs> that if you plug it into a phone, it does things. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we're going to see more of this cyber security. Well, we are seeing more all the time. Um, and it makes me want to read some of the Cold War books because these tactics aren't exactly new. They're just being applied to new platforms. It's mm -hmm. still spy games. The Cold War yeah. changed. I mean, sure, it ended between us and Russia. But now there's a different type of Cold War where there's not as much, like, guns involved. It's just cybersecurity attacks. And yeah, we, I, wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't even really call this cold, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's this, this may be like one of the hottest wars ever that's been going on for the last 10 years and we've been very unaware and i think over the last five years it's, it's gotten a bit warmer because of our political climate yeah um you know and after and, things like stuxnet comes to light yeah um I there, there's a whole book out on stuxnet of how our government participated in this um so and i think that you know if if we weren't the first people to do it um, then we're already losing the war, right? Because right. we're the first people to make it to the moon. So hopefully we, hopefully this is because we've inspired the rest of the world to make cyber arms and yeah. not the other way around. Because uh, if we're behind... I were behind. Then that's not good. <laughs> yeah, I think we're a little behind on it. We're getting there. Um, and we'll ramp up quick to it, hopefully. But it's it's uh, it, the Israelis, I'm sorry. They're, oh, they're yes. on top of it. Oh, yeah. We play second fiddle to their cybersecurity stuff. They're just... They're... It's part of their military. It's like an open piece. We have the NSA. They have, I, they, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a special unit of the military that's, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll find a link and leave it in the show notes uh, to discuss that. There's a great Dark Neck Diaries um, episode that just covers how the how Israeli works their military into their cybersecurity as one unit. It's brilliant. It's um, unit eighty two hundred. If yes, you want to go look into that, yeah, one. unit eighty two hundred. Uh, dig into that, and it's just wow. Um, this was it's security related because it's your data. We already know Facebook basically, and no, nothing is said more about Facebook. But if you've had your data on Facebook, it's been pwned at some point. It's been yes. dumped somewhere. Your passwords. Just if you're going to be on Facebook, change your password every now and then because who knows if they still have it in plain text. But this <laughs> at is at least every three months. At least every three months because it's Facebook. They're who knows what they're doing with that password. Don't reuse it anywhere because they have copies of it. But Please. anyways, which they said we're sorry for. But, <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, they always say we're sorry. That's it. Um, but this is something interesting, and Facebook is starting to slowly address all of its issues related to elections and everything else and buying ads for political things, but now carding as a service. Um, <laughs> wow. If you want to buy illegal things, Facebook Marketplace, turns out no problem there. Um, Facebook's only recently decided to start taking this down. Mm. 
So peddling wares, peddling access, peddling your credit card number and people selling it, I'll sell this credit card, I'll sell this bulk of credit cards. Like publicly, like on Facebook Marketplace, and there's a link here uh, of all the, just the screenshots. And it's only by these big agencies such as Talos and Krebs on Security both covering this that Facebook goes, oh, well, I guess that probably shouldn't be on the marketplace. I mean, the marketplace does say not to do illegal things, but no one's actually enforcing it. Right. If you've ever visited the Facebook marketplace, you know it's items on there that shouldn't be there. And so, like, that yeah. kind of puts me in a weird situation just because, like, I understand where they're coming from as, my, like, as uh, Facebook, excuse me, but um, didn't we have two dudes just go to jail for running Backpage? Yeah. For having people put things on the website that they had no control over. Yeah. Not to mention they worked with federal agencies to be able to, you know, to, to investigate it. it. Yeah, yeah that was re- this is really interesting that Facebook is just getting because they're the facilitator, um, and it, they're and it's more or less being actively. You, how do they not know? People are literally you can type in credit card numbers for sale. <laughs> it's yeah, it's not like up. they're doing anything. They're not even using code words here. Right. So I thought that was, uh, yeah. And this know. is how you get hacked, right? This because is how, yeah, because you you put all your personal information on Facebook. Yes, uh, that gets harvested for one, and then that goes back up to sell on the very platform from which it was harvested. Yeah, and then uh, they add on your credit card number, and then they have a little bit more personal information about you because they sold your social security number or whatever, and they'll probably sell a link to your Facebook profile at the same time, so you can now answer any security questions that come up. Because oh look, they posted pictures of their dog Rover. What's their dog's name? Rover. They posted where they went to high school, where they went to kindergarten. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Ah, mm-hmm. Rover. Good old Rover. Complete social <laughs> engineering attack because you surrendered all your data there. Now, this is this was interesting, Shodan Search, and it's taking a little bit. It's finally gaining a little attention, but more than 13,000 misconfigured iSCSI storage clusters accessible via the public internet. And... Wow, if you're not familiar with how iSCSI works. So iSCSI is a data protocol for managing or mounting a hard drive. It's often used in things like, and I have a few videos on this for when you set up a virtualization server, whether it be uh, VMware, XCP, or other ones, you can use an iSCSI target. And it's basically hard drives mounted across a network. Network, not the internet. Could you do it across the internet? Yeah, it's a routed protocol. Hmm. Why is it open to the internet 13,000 times? I don't know. And uh, in this, if you follow this article, it'll be in the show notes here, they show they mounted them all, and these are people's backup drives or all kinds of things in there. So wow. you mount them just like a hard drive, and you can see that hard drive. Uh, they're just completely exposed, and specifically the Shodan search. We already know there's a bunch of encrypted ones. Hmm. These are all the unencrypted ones where there's wow. no username or password. Uh, the Shodan search is uh, port colon 3260, um, and then you it's the you put the command string and equals no auth is that is all you have to do, and it will dump and list them. That's all in there. Um, and I went and looked today. There's more now than when the article got posted the other day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> As of before, I sat down Good right here an hour ago. There was like another thousand of them on there. Whoopsie. So. Cool that Shodan is scanning for that. That's interesting. Crazy that there's that much out there. And so, I'll, so how do we get around this misconfiguration? Who, I I don't know. One of two things: either someone is just a complete blithering moron, mm-hmm. or Lois Bitter. Um, <laughs> Lois Bitter got the security job. Lois Bitter. There <laughs> we go. Well, that, that explains everything. Yeah, because who opens up the hard drive directly to the internet? About thirteen thousand people. Plus, well, almost wow, pushing wow. 14,000 as of uh, right now. And maybe more by the time you watch this video. <laughs> oh, just a lot of information. Yeah, so that was, it was those little things that I was just face palming about. I never thought to use Shodan to search for ice because he, neither did, this, neither did anyone else until they did. <laughs> and they're like, then they started mounting all the drives. And you're like, wow, I'm just mounting hard drives all over the world. Whoops. I think we only have about 8,000 of them or 5,000 of them in the U.S. The, it gets number, it gets a little smaller when it's here in the U.S. So... At what point is this illegal, Tom? Because if I go and I mount your hard drive, I didn't go read it. I just mounted it. I didn't take any data. I didn't put any data. It's on the internet. It's publicly accessible. I mounted it. That's legal, right? Come on. Ooh. I mean, I know. Hold on, wait. Disclaimer. Mounting part disclaimer. Legal? We aren't giving out legal advice. <laughs> yeah. This don't. is not legal advice. <laughs> but I'm just saying, hypothetically. Yeah. It, because it's 
you know, it's like accessing a website. It's I'm pulling data from it. So right. if you pushed it public on there, where does that log? I'm not logging in. I'm not typing admin admin. I didn't guess a weak <laughs> password. Right. No credentials for no, me. There's no credentials. I'm just going on there and reading just like a website. And you publicly exposed it. So I think that opens up, and I don't know, uh, maybe someone who has better experience and can cite which law we would be breaking or not breaking. Meet us in the comments. We read them. Yeah, meet, meet us in the comments. Um, that is an interesting aspect of there because if I didn't pull all that. Now, this is also because this case got heard here locally. Uh, there was a local computer store that swapped computers because the guys were morons and they got sued over it. But mm. turns out other person being in possession of data is not illegal. It was only illegal if that person does that. And the, the people were not nefarious. It was just a mistake by these other computer company who had had two similar computers and swapped them to the different wrong people. Oh. So now all that personal data is in someone else's hands. But that doesn't break the law because the company, that there was no intention of doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. If you do it and you do have a bunch of information, as long as you're not intending to do anything, does that fall into the same category? This is interesting stuff. And this is why cyber is so fun. <laughs> yeah. And, and unless you're the one that's setting the case precedence, then it's really you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> Better call Johnny Cochran. Oh, wait. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Rest in peace. And uh, next article I have here is Michigan practice forced to close following ransom attack. And I actually have a client that this told me that was his plan. If HIPAA showed up, he's going to retire. <laughs> I was like, and it's, it just wasn't my client that this happened to, even though it was a Michigan company. Mm -hmm. Basically, they got ransomware attack. They didn't have backups. They didn't have proper, um, the proper ways to mitigate this and no way to restore. So they said, hey, we're just going to close the practice. We're thinking about retiring. Uh, we got our perfect excuse to retire. Wow. Talk about your golden parachute by way of crypto locker. Yeah. So like, yeah, we're retiring now. Uh, the patients are not happy. It also creates another problem because the... Data is encrypted, and they apparently, if I understood this correctly, doesn't look like any data was exfiltrated. So they're not in violation in terms of having to notify patients of breach. Wow. It's more of, we lost all your data. Wow. And it's kind of sad because this, this has come up before. There's a few companies I know um, that we've tried to get them to be more conscious of backups. Like, they're a backup failure away from going out of business, too, because they don't have proper redundancies for mm -hmm. things. Um it's you it almost took out this other accounting firm we dealt with. Nothing's bad happened in terms of security, which is a shock because they use the same password everywhere. But the hard drive failed, and he had no backups because he didn't feel like paying the bill. And he let he was using his own backup software, and he didn't pay like the Carbonite, so he didn't renew it, and it quit backing up because his credit card expired, and he ignored all those notices. And then when it died, uh, he had to pay teams of people because he his backup plan was he printed lots of corporate returns. So someone had to key all those corporate returns back in. Wow. So it cost him a lot of money because the hard drive was shot. There was Even the data recovery people were like, yeah, that's broke. <laughs> I mean, it should be a big warning to small businesses. I mean, I know um, sometimes they don't have the funding to do such things, but it's very important. Yeah, they really it can cost you your business it. in the end, and that's more important than you know a couple thousand. Yeah, and a lot of them we've we've got so many clients like that. You know, it's like they're rolling in a Mercedes C Class in a parking lot, and you can't sell them on a two hundred dollar a month backup solution. They're like, whoa, 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 man. Good I mean, point. I mean, I, I couldn't get the C Class then. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to pay four hundred dollars for my oil change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to pay you for your $200 so, service. So with the, some of these things, we figured we we're going to wrap the show up with uh, walking through some of the layers of security. Uh, this is, it could be blast is about remediation. So obviously you two-factor things like that. We always say that, but let's, we're, we, we have a little borrow here. So if you see our eyes glancing <laughs> over here, it's because we actually made a list so it can be concise. Uh, but we're going to start with first layer, end users. We all want to complain about them working in the tech world. We know that they're the people who clicked on the stupid link and got the stupid prize, and you want to choke them. You want to be aggravated with the end user that did it, but mm -hmm. you also need to do everything you can to protect those end users. So we'll start with a couple suggestions there. One of them is uh, know before. If you haven't heard of it, it's uh, Kevin Mitnick is involved in this. It's a company that does training, and it does cybersecurity training, and it does phishing training. So you bring your users in, you run them down on the list. Like you, and It's not boring. They have some pretty cool plans in there. And you're like, hey, uh, let's go ahead and train you on this, or what does a phishing email look like? And then you send out sample emails to them, and they give you templates. So you, as a IT person, can use these templates and test your users. So you 
craft these to try to get them to click on links. And if they click on the link, that's a phishing one, they win more training, you know, and you work with HR to uh, implement policies like that. So it's kind of, it's kind of fun. I know they do this at uh, my friends who work at universities said there's nothing more fun than getting a professor to click on a phishing link because they're way smarter than anyone there. Just ask them. And they're willing to proclaim this while they have to go through more training not to click on phishing emails. <clears throat> there's a local university that maybe we all know about. Did you hear about the invoice attack? No, I did not. So they, uh, someone started sending out phishing emails with invoices attached. Now, my friends who work in the IT room are like, why as a professor would you ever get an invoice from the university? And they go, well, that's what we were wondering too. So we all passed around and opened them and they wouldn't open. And then he, we went to other computers and tried to open them. So they, they just basically made a mess of things. <laughs> and so you want to focus a lot on who they trust, making sure they have a clear escalation path process for them, mm -hmm. right? Like this is this is the steps you go through as an end user. Uh, if anyone asks you these questions, here's like red flag questions. Like, um, are people asking for your password? Because IT does not ask you for your password. Never. Was it IT that's calling you or was it outside? Look at that extension. Call IT back. You know the number. You know, really train them on that, that someone yeah. may be after them. That's because right. uh, they are. Because that's the, from a hacking standpoint, how is it the end users? Is that where you pretty much, do you, do you go to the IT department or where are you going to get in there? The, the end user is the first, the first person we're going after. Yeah. The first. You're going to walk in there with an ID badge that says, I'm from the power company. I'm from Comcast Cable. And you're going to walk right past them. No need to get to the hacking the network part if I can just get the password from one of the end users. Yeah. And just go straight in. That so. is like your, you can't, you can't express how much time you should be spending. Almost as much as you can have a cool, fancy firewall in the back. Yeah. And, and then and then Bob in accounting goes, he said he was from Comcast. I let him sit down on my computer. He needed to test something. Done. <laughs> what do you mean he oh. took all the bank account information? <laughs> what do you mean he's the man in the middle? Protect sensitive data. You know, you go drinking at the bar, leave the laptops locked up somewhere. Don't leave them in your car for someone to break in your car and steal it. Or, or, or if you're going to do that, encrypt your hard drive. Yeah, at least. <laughs> encrypt the hard drive. Do everything you can, but I would say the end user is almost more important than the firewall. Almost, you know what I mean? Yep. It's because the end user is a trust monitor that goes be behind the firewall often. Yes. And so if I can yeah. get onto you know some host that's owned by a person mm -hmm. who has access, then I'm going to be able to have per, you know persistent network access, and then I'll be able to laterally move and get on the scanner, and now I have a beachhead. Yeah, and, and that's look at all your scanners. Yeah, you'll you'll end up with whatever that user's permissions are, and that's that edge that they're looking for, um, and making sure that your end users understand the consequences. Like you are in trouble if you if you didn't check that guy's badge that says he's from Comcast. Mm -hmm. You're in trouble if you swipe someone in under your door access card. Nobody tailgates, and we've mentioned Jason Street before. No tailgating. He, that's one of his number ways, number one he's in. You know, he shows up just like an old man in a wheelchair, and he's like, "Yeah, I'll do that." Because <laughs> trust no one. Trust no one, because he you, you feel sorry for him, or he's limping because he's walking with a cane because he's faking it, and he goes, "Oh, can you hold that door for me?" And he has a badge that looks right. And you're like, "Oh man, that guy, poor dude's got his leg hurt. Let me just swipe for him real quick." He didn't even have a badge. You just let him in. Or I'll be the dude that just stands outside of your office with the sign that says, "We'll work for food." And, uh, you know, I have a badge cloner that's, yeah. <laughs> that's right, right on me and uh, Wi-Fi pineapple. Yeah. you got to watch closely all this. But like I said, focusing, that's like one of those really big things. Next thing, physical layer, locks and door access. Kind of that same thing, though. Making sure you have everything automatically locking. So I like when I go to some of the clients and I was at a hospital Every door locks behind you. They don't leave, even me, even though I'm a vendor coming in there and I'm being escorted by the IT, um, they don't leave me in IT rooms. They will lock the door, stand next to it, lock the door, and then they'll go get something, come back and unlock, and I go back in. That level of access, hey, I, I completely don't question it. It was inconvenient for me, but it's one of those, they do everything right. I'm fine with that. Uh, and make sure your users are trained like that. Who never just prop a door open with a whatever, uh, <laughs> kick the door open, you set something in there because I got to get back into this room. That door open once, that's that That's that in, that door to the comm room. Make sure those comm rooms are locked. We just did some relocating for a school because they thought they were secure. <laughs> oh boy. You know, they, they put the, uh, because it was convenient, there was a room big enough that where all the IDF was mounted for all the switching. <laughs> They made it the teachers slash lounge, and they don't really check who goes in there because there's a they go outside and smoke, so there's an external egress yeah. there to get in and out. And 
it's not even a locked rack. We talked him into putting a locked rack in, <laughs> but it was just like, you could just reach up. It, I mean, granted, it was about, though, the bottom was like six foot off the ground because it's up high, but it's just like a lounge where they're all hanging out and drinking yeah. coffee, and I'm like, you could just plug in anything there. You're on the network right there. No, mm-hmm. Just exposed wires, no door or anything on there. Ugh. You got to look at some of those physical layers like that because that's another spot. I'm going to look, if I, if we're doing a red team pen test, you're going to look for ports to plug into, yep. um, things like that. <laughs> Also related to that physical layer, turn off ports that aren't in use. Turn them on as needed. Mm. Uh, if you do that, if you're you know if you're running any corporate network and you run a managed firewall, do you turn off all the extra ports that are plugged into because you had the areas wired? You just go in. Is anything in any of these ports? Start turning them off. You'll find out if they're needed because someone will go, hey, I plugged into a, you know a room 12 B13 <laughs> port. It doesn't work. Go back and turn that one because you know you need to now. Yeah. Verify of course, but. Turning everything off, and what you're really trying to do is reduce your threat service, mm-hmm. reduce where it is. There was a um, someone on Reddit was doing a breakdown, and as they said, above their pay grade is where it landed. <laughs> they found the Raspberry Pi plugged in in their network because Good someone had access to the wiring closet. They figured out who it belonged to, and uh, it's a great read. If I could find it, I'll throw it in there. But it's it's it found a mystery device on a network. Was the Reddit title, and uh, the person found out that the keys and the door access they had that some guy a contractor who had left was granted for reasons unknown to him, thirty days after his departure, access to things like they didn't turn his door card off for thirty extra days. Wow, that's a long time. It's a long well, it's long enough to go in there and drop a Raspberry Pi in, and they're really not clear on what all it was doing. He did some reverse engineering and figured out at least some of the sniffing it was doing, but that's the kind of stuff that happens. You plug those things in, you have it sitting in a network, and think about how small a Raspberry mm-hmm. Pi is, and now you're sitting there, you know, uh, exfiltrating data and things like that, either via VPN out, but it's it becomes part of the network infrastructure. And yeah, my favorite is the Land Turtle personally because yeah. it has the out of band 3G. Uh, out of band 3G. Mm-hmm. They were using. Uh, they knew they were proximity because they were using a Raspberry Pi with Wi-Fi. Oh boy. Oh, yeah. So it snipped. That's how it helped hide itself from the network was because it's Wi-Fi, but they know it's getting picked up somewhere local. Gotta go out of band. Yep, you go out of band you have like a that. cool point to point that just goes four or five miles out. Point to point, there's an option. <laughs> but even 4G is cheap now. Yeah. You can get a 4G and mm-hmm. be in someone's network and have cell phone signal. What, you're going to listen for a cell phone signal in the network? I wonder if there's one going off right now on my network. Right. There's so many cell phone signals. That's a really hard one to find. Yeah. So that's... Big on the physical layer, uh, think about it a lot. It goes right hand-in-hand hand with the end users, keeping them secure. Um, and this is what some of the red teams do. They really focus on, around that. Now, we'll get into the software layers a little bit now. The firewall. Every Hollywood movie, that's what they do. They <laughs> pop the firewall. They pop the firewall. Now, granted, there's clearly some firewall misconfiguration going on when we see iSCSI, uh, 13,000 of them is publicly facing. Right. Yeah. We know that there's some firewalls misconfigured. We know those are methods of breach. But it's not the most common way. If you're assessing a target and you're trying to get into that target, yeah, cool, you want to know what's on the firewall. You're going to look for things like RDP open, uh, what VPN do they use, and stuff like that. But then you're going to jump back to the end user because, okay, I know RDP, but now I have to get an end user's password. A good firewall is nice, and it should have a good IDS, IPS, so intrusion detection, intrusion prevention system. But that's for people who are just spraying noise at the firewall and blocking them because they're, you know, saying things out. They're angry IP scanning you and things like that. Mm-hmm. That's not how someone who's targeting you or looking closely, they're not going to be noisy. Noisy right. is what you do at the end of the game, not right. the beginning. Right. So frequently things don't even trip up your IDS, IPS. Uh, it just becomes there. Now, what's really helpful and I'm going to be doing some videos on this, and I was having some conversations with the people over at the Security Onion because we're looking at putting this in for a client. Uh, but Security Onion helps a lot with that logging side of the firewall because this is where you do want to spend a little bit of money. And the logging is important because it, we will walk you through a scenario. You have something that trips off your intrusion detection system. You're like, okay, this computer communicated with this IP address. Then you start going through your metadata logging, what other computers? The next thing you know, you're like, wait a minute, this trips something because they did something, but there's a whole history of this mm-hmm. IP address talking to lots of different computers. That provides you that investigative part you need mm-hmm. for that. Mm-hmm. And uh, granted, that's a reactive side of things, but sometimes that reactive side, because they may not have triggered in your network, but you'll see a pattern of what they're doing in there. And uh, Security Onion is popular, uh, Alien Vault. Um, OTX, another, yep, yep, Open Threat Exchange. Uh, Security Onion is one of my favorites. I love, 
love, love, love Security Onion. It's just got a very no nonsense, open source yeah. f- approach about it. And uh, I've even deployed it out in AWS and have been able to get some data into uh, some really fun, fun visualizations. Yeah, and uh, if Security Onion comes uh, completely built as a, it's a free download, you can get this, uh, with Kibana and everything configured on there. So it lets, and one of the things it does with the whole search system it has, because it also uses Bro um, and a few other tools, all pre-configured out of the box. Like you can have this thing stood up and running uh, following your instructions in about 15, 20 minutes. I mean, it takes longer to download than it does to get like a basic setup of Security Onion so you can start playing with it and start slicing up the networks but that is an important aspect to you're trying to understand because once something trips they may not have gotten in but now you have that forensics information you're looking for and then we come back down to the endpoints what should you have there so antivirus antivirus mm-hmm. because they're all signature based and we've talked about how these things get missed all the time it's still reactive but it still helps that's it helps. another it, it's another piece because they frequently will use like we talked about Mimi cats uh, that would be <laughs> caught by most any modern antivirus right. so clearly there was a gap in the star uh, Starwood hotel line the fact that they had that installed so oh boy. yeah um, web filtering to help block out websites that goes hand in hand that's something we do on the endpoints uh, there's a couple things that come with web filtering and as opposed to doing it from the firewall when you have it at the endpoint level you have an SSL certain installed so the web filtering software can understand it. Um, I've mentioned before I use a SolarWinds product, but there's a lot of other products out there, WebRoot and things like that, that offer some of those endpoint filtering like that. Now, one other thing we run, and it's, I believe, referred to as an EBR solution, uh, but Huntress Labs. What they're running, and there's other companies, CrowdStrike makes a really cool product for this too. There's a handful of them out there. Um, What they do is they look at the endpoint and go, all right, what is on here in the startup? What is running? And if anything pops up in there, they alert right away, something new added to startup. And if it's not something they've ever seen before, like, hey, cool, it's a Microsoft Office startup application. If it's it's a completely normal app and they use all signature based on this, if this app is asking for network connections, they start logging immediately. They go, this is a new app, for some reason wants network connectivity when it starts up. If companies like, oh, let's say Target would have had those uh, <laughs> on their systems that were running uh, because they added startup applications to monitor the credits uh, processing that was going on. So when everybody rebooted the service for an update, they just came right back. Those applications that are running and doing that, uh, different solutions that offered by CrowdStrike, that's that really focused endpoint. Now, there are open source versions of this. There is uh, OSEC in Wazoo. Uh, they're very similar. Wazoo is a little bit easier to handle. OSEC, uh, hard. I took the time to learn it a little bit. <laughs> it can be a good way to use a series of signatures to understand behavior and stop something from happening. Uh, matter of fact, I have broke things myself. I locked myself out of one of our servers. <laughs> I was trying to edit a table. And because I wasn't editing the table in a SQL database through the normal method, I had uh, jumped into it, just wanted to use PHP MyAdmin my and turn it on and did it. It seen me as an attacker and locked me out of the complete system right away and sent an alert. And I'm like, oh, I'm the attacker. First, I get a panic, so I'm getting attack notes. And I'm like, I'm the, that's me. <laughs> so um, it, did, it, it did its thing because I was not using the at web application through the web interface. I was using a table, and that comes back to ways you can tune OSEC um, to watch that server level watch that endpoint level for that behavior the yeah, OSSEC is uh is very very fun i have some of that running over in my enterprise and it's it's scalable oh um, hugely it, scalable it it's, goes, it's a big learning curve to learn it though yep. <laughs> and i mean you uh you get you get it tuned up right and you get some of that data going to your security center and boy oh boy do you get some some scary looking data yeah, it takes a it takes a lot to tune it, um, and if you want to look at a more complete stack, you can look at uh, Wazoo. Mm-hmm. So Security Onion incorporates a lot of things, including the Wazoo uh, platform, but you can also stand up Wazoo by itself. Once again, fully open source and has a cool interface on there. There's uh, complete virtual machines, I believe you can download of it. Yep. So if you just want to play with it in your uh, lab environment at home mm-hmm. and test it out, you can stand up a server pretty quick. It's quick to get set up. Uh, I would say harder to get deployed because lots and lots of tuning because you have to figure out what's going to send an alert what yep. on your daily use you, case you know is. what we we don't really touch on this enough actually a lot of these security tools that we talk about takes a lot of tun- tuning yeah and that's the yeah. reason why we're security into well, I'm security engineer right yeah. so uh you know the the splunks of the world right the log analytics and the, the those sorts of tools are not very uh 
simple. You have to make sure you got the queries. You got to make sure you got the visualizations. Mm -hmm. you make sure the connectivity is there. Make sure you have everything spec'd out right for storage. Like Security Onion? Yeah. Security Onion takes some storage. Man. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, boy. That's, you, it's you no run, joke. If you want to put security in an environment, um, you're talking about building bare metal, not virtualized, a hardcore server to run it. Like, it'll, it'll have to be modern, fast, lots of processors, lots of RAM. Yep. And if you want to do full logging, like yep. you do with your virtual support mirror of, mm -hmm. so you take all the data coming in your WAN and you mirror it over so security Union has visibility in all of it, you have to be able to handle the volume of data and the storage that comes along with it based on how long you want to do. Because it's going to do full packet capture and full PCAP, but you may only have enough of that to handle maybe let's say seven days worth of right. your storage because it depending on the size of the pipe coming in and how much data flows across um, and then after that it stores the metadata information but uh, sometimes by the time you get to the metadata it you're starting to lose some of the forensics integrity when you do that but it comes down to how much can you afford to send because what you're doing is you're actually mirroring every piece of data going in and out of your office to to log it to that you have to find that happy middle and this comes back to if you segment your network into different segmentations mm -hmm. which i didn't really cover but i guess you could say at the software level you definitely want to not have a flat network you want to create a series of least access do these people need access to that but when your network is segmented off like that you can say okay i only really want security in to watch this segment of my network right and uh, it can be very enlightening because you may only want to watch like a special server side of your network right. or you could even set, set up different security onions because it has a uh, master slave system so you can set up different nodes or sensors as they refer to them so you can have some of the smaller sensors feeding back to the main system yeah one of my favorite things to do and this is a, a project that's going to take some heavy lifting if you want to replicate it uh, is to put security onion on honeypots Oh, um, or, or put the uh, uh, set up the network so that security onion is actually looking at that VLAN in which my IoT cameras are on that may still have default creds, right? Yeah, um, because you get to see some really, really interesting traffic. Um, people are scanning for those sorts of things. You will see a lot of malware. These malwares won't do things, but you know they, they do the small things like dropping, right? Yeah. So it'll come along, it'll go, okay, you need to do a W get to this shady URI to go get this package that's made for MIPS and then you know execute it. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it's it's uh, it's an interesting, uh, it's definitely an interesting tool. I think that if you have any amount of time on your on your hands, you should go check it out because yeah, it's very uh, well thought through, enterprise ready. Enterprise yeah, great. We're looking, I mean, we'll be, the discussion, the reason I was talking to the security people is looking at enterprise deployment. And uh, they're, they're offering free open source, but they have a, a security engineer, so they help you stand up the product and get it all going in there. And they help you spec it out and things like that. And then once you're done, uh, we'll do the consulting on the uh, regular basis of fine tuning and some of the other things. Uh, what, it's just this the size and scope of the company I'm doing some consulting with is quite large and it's going to go across numerous sites. Uh, 17 public facing firewalls. So 17, oh. 17 installs. Uh, yeah. So there's just a lot going on uh, to make this uh, for that site. So sweet. Yeah. So hopefully it's helpful. I'll leave links to all these things where you can get them. Uh, and most of these tools you can get for free. And uh, maybe we'll do another episode on honey potting too if there's some interest. So let us know on that because that could be a fun topic. Yeah, let us know. Um, I got some friends over at Ativo, uh, the shameless plug. They are the leaders in deception right now. I would love to get them in here and do some discussion. Maybe they'll yeah. sponsor episode. Yeah. Bring and us some Ativo beers or something. There we go. Then. Um, <laughs> But uh, what's that other one, the, the T-Mobile AWS Honeypot? We can probably talk about oh, some of that sometime. Oh, yeah, Teapot. Yeah. Oh, teapot. my God, Teapot is awesome. Yes, I'm running one of those you heard right me now. right, T-Mobile, um, and it's the T-Mobile Honeypot called Teapot. So yeah, and you know what? Uh, T-Mobile is doing really, really good stuff. They're like the next Netflix when it comes to open source softwares, and Capital One's doing some really cool stuff. Uh, but T-Mobile has something called PacBot, P-A-C-B-O-T. Mm -hmm. Check that out. Um, that's your policy and access control bot. It actually goes through and tells you over permissive policies, over permission roles, etc. cetera. Um, and then Capital One has uh, another really cool project. Open source software is like taking off. Oh, These yeah. huge companies are like mm -hmm. investing. Um, oh, they have something called Cloud Custodian. Um, and it actually goes through and helps you clean up resources and keep resources in a compliant state. Um, in AWS, those are two things that I would suggest you guys go check out that are pretty fun. 
Yeah, it, like I said, it's it's crazy. Some of the and it's all open source. I mean, when you look at the enterprise, and that's how I got into some of this consulting for this company is because my open source background. Um, these guy, these companies are excited about it because they don't mind paying to have the security engineers come out and set it up. But at the end, they end up with all these huge license fees and everything else. Like, well, if we'll pay to set up, but then we get to own the code, and if we ever want to contribute back to development, in there's some interesting dynamics mm -hmm. there. So that's why all these companies are realizing open source. I mean, uh, in hey, we just the is it, how do you pronounce it? The new the NSA reverse tool, G Giedra. I don't know how to Gidra. pronounce it either. G, yeah, G, I don't know. I pronounce they, it Ghidra. Ghidra. I think that's actually how it's yeah. said. I think he's right. <laughs> uh, they just released all the source code to that. So, I mean, that's fully open source now. That's a reverse engineering tool. We'll buy our tax dollars at work here. <laughs> I don't mind government tax dollars towards open source projects. I can justify that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> I'm a little more comfortable with that. So, I've always believed if it's uh, my tax dollars going towards the code, the code that should be open source, even though it's a reverse engineering tool written by the NSA. Right. I think they're just trying to win brownie points with the world, and uh, it's a good PR move to open source it. But hey, cool, it they is. did. I'll take the tools. Thank and you. and I think it's also one of those things. More and more people reverse engineering things with those tools mm -hmm. means more and more potential people that they go, I'll hire you. <laughs> exactly all right we're out have fun thanks for joining us uh see you next time leave comments and suggestions below as always we do read the comments peace, peace. all right later